Hi, and welcome to module two of lecture eight. In this module, we're going to discuss empirical probability distributions. Now, a lot of the stuff you're going to have seen before, um, not only in, in coursework, on the graduate coursework or earlier, but in everyday life. Um, empirical probability distributions occur all over the place in news media, um, TV, newspapers, whatever, because they're just, they're common, um, they're just common. Now, you might ask, you know, why are we going to discuss this then if they're so common? The reason is one of the first things that's, one of the most difficult things that new graduate students often have issues with when they move into in doing social science is to generalize. Right? So science is about generalization, but oftentimes people have in their heads a particular example, a particular case um, that, you know, not even, not just, when I say case, I don't necessarily mean, you know, country, I mean in particular single example, you know, this president or, you know, that one vote from Congress that drives a lot of their thinking. And one of the big challenges you have in going forward through science is to generalize from the ideas that perhaps that individual case generated to larger generalizations about the world and how the world works. And distributions really help us get there. So by going through empirical distributions, the hope briefly on this one module, the hope is um, to help transition in thinking from particular individual cases to the larger world and the distribution of all cases that could occur. Okay. So we're going to begin with the notion of a frequency distribution, an empirical frequency distribution. And this is something you've seen before, again, pretty commonly, and all it is is a statement of some list of the, rel of the numbers of occurrences of each of a series of values of some random variable. So for instance, if we're talking about votes, and individuals might vote for particular um, parties in some election, then we might list the frequencies that each um, party was voted for. So if we had, say, um, this is a left-wing party and a right-wing party, and maybe there's also a liberal party and a conservative party, and maybe there's a constitutional party, um, and a libertarian party, and a green party, and so on and so forth, and it can be a small number of parties or a large number of parties. But if we want to list the number of votes for these parties, we could then make a frequency table, and apologize for the poor lines, and stick in on the right side the frequencies, so these are parties, stick in the right side the frequencies that all these things happen in. So we might say, I don't know, um, in this case, we could have 31 and 40, it's a very small action, um, and you know, 10 and 5 and 2 and 3 and 2 in this particular action. Right? These numbers, which I just made up obviously, um, tell you the frequencies of votes for each um, party in this election. That's all a frequency distribution does. It tells you the frequency that each one of these values of the random variable party here um, is realized, right? Left was realized 31 times, right was realized 40 times, and so on. And these are of obvious interest, I hope, um, in studying elections because you have to know how many votes each party got. If we then were translating this into, um, say, seat shares in some kind of parliamentary government, we might decide that, that, that you know, there were three seat shares here and four seat shares here and one, and the rest of them all got zero, right? Maybe if there's some kind of one to 10 sort of, try 10 to one kind of rule here. These are gonna be seat shares. Point is, you can specify the frequency of each of these variables, of each of these realizations of the random variable party um, by telling us how often each one occurs. That's a frequency distribution. Nothing fancy about that at all. Um, now, oftentimes we don't want a raw frequency distribution, we want is a relative frequency distribution. We want to know exactly um, how often these things happen relative to what could have happened, right? We want something closer to a probability than just a, like a raw frequency number. So we do is we take each one, I shouldn't have written the last column there. Let's see what I can do about this. Um, let's use um, C chairs for this one. If you want relative frequency, 
Well, we take the total number of things. In this case, there's 3 plus 4 plus 1 is 8. And we divide the individual number of cases by the total number of cases to give us a relative frequency. So here we would have 3 eighths and 4 eighths and 1 eighth. And that will tell us the relative frequency of each of each category. Again, you've seen this before, right? All we're saying here is saying that one half of all the cases, of a, one half of the seed shares went to the right wing party in this case, and three eighths went to the left wing party, and one eighth to the liberal party. Um, that's it. <laughs> that's all this is saying, right? It's not particularly deep and fancy, but it gives you a sense of how we tend to think of these kind of things because. You might be thinking of a particular um, coalition in which the um, right-wing party and the liberal party formed the coalition in order to govern, and that particular case really drives a lot of your theorizing. But the fact is, there are other scenarios in which you might have had different realizations of parties of the seat shares, and that might have led to different theorizing. So to be careful, the theorizing is not based on a single case, but that it it treats the mechanisms that led to that case more broadly such that you can apply the same causal mechanisms to other cases and show how they lead to the realization of other cases as well. Um, so for instance, if your particular theory says that the particular scenario of um, voters' preferences at that moment will always produce uh, a vote for the right-wing party, that theory is going to have a hard time because unless you're dealing with like, unless every case happened to turn out with 100% of all frequency, of relative frequency in the right-wing party, there will be times you're just wrong because you're not considering the possibility of other parties being voted for because your theory did not talk about the mechanisms that increase or decrease the chance of voting for a particular party, but rather just specified a particular party would be voted for always, probably based on some particular case you had in mind. Um, you know, or, you know, it's definite that the um, Democratic uh, president, the Democratic candidate will win the presidency in the U.S. next election. Again, um, if you distributed, there's some randomness involved there, and probably if you ran the election multiple times, the Democrat would win sometimes, the Republican would win sometimes, and probably with some tiny, tiny probability, random stuff would happen, such that a third party would actually win just because of... Um, random events, right? We got in closer times. Point is, who wins? The winner is a random variable distributed in some fashion, and that distribution is going to be determined by a bunch of other independent variables that might shift the distribution around and change the probabilities around, but the actual winner is a draw from a random variable. It's a realization of the random variable, and if we did it a bunch of times, we could trace out a frequency distribution of all the times each um, party won, and that would give us a better sense of how that variable is distributed than a single draw from it, which wouldn't give us a real good sense of how the variable is distributed. The frequency tells you the raw numbers. The relative frequency tells you the relative numbers to give you something closer to probability. And that's um, the basics of empirical probability. Again, you've seen this before, but it's good to get thinking about things in terms of distributions and random variables as opposed to particular um, realizations of those variables. Two more topics we want to talk about briefly in this in this module. Um, the next, um, well, I should say three. Oftentimes, a better way to represent these kind of relative frequencies is graphically. One way you've undoubtedly seen before is a histogram. A histogram for the discrete variable says you might have um, left and right and liberal and conservative and so on I'm tired of drawing things so you could um, write the relative frequency with these bar represented by bars and the bars might tell you and this is not actually the scale because I'm not good at the drawing these bars but and onward onward to the other parties so smaller numbers the histogram tells you the relative frequency and the height of the bar tells you the relative frequency um, of each of the categories, in this case, right, the, the bars, right? So the height of this bar over here tells you the relative frequency of left-wing votes. The height of this bar over here tells you the relative frequency of the right-wing votes, and so on and so forth. 
Um, a histogram is a good way of representing these things graphically. And graphically is often an easy way of seeing these things for many people. So oftentimes you will see relative frequencies represented not with numbers, but rather with a histogram or some other form of graphical representation. Moving on, we can look at also joint distributions of two variables. Um, so for instance, the quick example here, we can look at voting and not voting and education and not education. Now, if we have some theory, we can use this for theorizing too. And this is called a contingency table. It tells you what we expect the frequencies to be contingent on what the other variable is. The, the frequencies of one variable contingent on the value of the other variable. Here's a two by two one. You could have an n by n one. If you have more than two variables, you could have an n by n by n one. It's, it's hard to actually represent. You can use this for theorizing. You might theorize that you should see a lot of values here and here and not so much in the other two. So educated people should vote a lot and not educated people should not vote a lot. And you should have fewer off diagonal terms in here or here. That'd be a theory and you could start off your theory by putting forth, by writing this table down and then putting your little high, high, low, low in each box. That's a way of theorizing. We'll stick here to empirics and say maybe we get a, an outcome of 60, 20, and 30, 50 in some nice planet. Um, people vote a lot. <laughs> so what do we get here? Well, here um, we get that indeed we get more, higher numbers in ed high education and voting, and also higher numbers in no edu not edu in lower education and not voting, and in lower numbers in the off diagonals. This would match your theory. This would provide support for your theory if you would go through and actually try to test it statistically using something like a chi squared test. Um, now, so that gives you a sense of joint um, frequencies. We can also look at marginal frequencies and marginal probabilities. If you recall, in the previous lecture, we discussed marginal probabilities as the um, unconditional probabilities. So the probability of B is going to equal the probability of A, sorry, of B given A sub J times the probability of A sub J. So what we're doing here, as we did in the previous lecture, is taking an unconditional probability and looking at all of its conditional component parts weighted by the chance of seeing each of the conditional component parts, as long as the AJ are disjoint and, and um, exhaustive. You sum them over all the different Js. This here is the marginal probability. It's unconditional. So in a sense, the frequencies in this table, in this contingency table, are conditional. It's the frequency of observing voting conditional on high education, and so on. We can compute the marginal frequencies by adding rows and columns. So if we add this column on the left here, we get 80. That's the, f that's the unconditional frequency of observing high education. In this particular sample, the unconditional frequency of low education is also 80. Now if we do the, the rows, we might get an unconditional frequency of seeing voting is 90, and a conditional an unconditional frequency of seeing not voting is 70. So the more people in the sample voted than not voted. Not unconditional, not related to education status. Total of the marginals, these are um, column marginals, these are row marginals, the total of each set is going to be the same because the total number of cases in your sample. That's 160 here. We might want something closer to probabilities, so we can divide these marginals by total cases. So for instance, we would find that one half of all cases had high education and one half had low. Nine sixteenths had, were voters and seven sixteenths were non-voters. And we can also look at the individual um, relative frequencies in each of these um, cells as well relative to um, either the marginals or the total. These marginals are going to be rele relevant in computing chi-squares in statistical tests, non-parametric statistical tests. Um, okay. So that's it. So these are marginal probabilities. These help you, these help you understand the marginal, um, freq marginal relative frequencies in your sample of observing any one of the variables when you have two or more variables. Um, in, in discrete cases. These are again used for discrete cases. For continuous cases, you can't write all the possible values of them on a table. So you can't use, use this. 
that's it. Um, so again, the main point of this, besides the fact to show you the, to get you thinking about um, distributions, was to lead you into looking at these distributions in a more formal fashion. Um, and that's going to be the topic of the next module when we're going to look at the theoretical distributions of these variables that we just covered empirically. So again, here are the empirical frequency distributions. We're now going to turn to the theoretical probability distributions from which these samples are presumably drawn. Thank you very much.